Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. CJ, how did we get here? When we did our Thursday show last week, we discussed a report about the Morello family of the Arizona Coyotes uh, possibly wanting new owners. And that situation has devolved ever since. And we are talking on April 11th, and there is a possibility that one week from today, the Arizona Coyotes could be moving to Salt Lake City. How did we get here? It's focused on dates. I, I don't think this is something that has to happen the next week. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if it takes, you know, a few weeks beyond the end of the regular season before everything's finalized. And that's because, you know, we're in a complex set of circumstances here. Essentially, what's being discussed, as far as I can tell, is that the NHL would buy the Coyotes from the Morello family and then flip them and sell them to the, the, the Smith group uh, at, that would see the team relocated to Salt Lake City. And the reason that's complicated is you don't just have one buyer and one seller talking to each other. There's there's a there's a middle person, right? And so the league is simultaneously working on two potential sales: one of the Coyotes to the NHL, the other of the NHL to to SEG, which would move the team to Salt Lake City. And so we we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. I mean, look, the news is the news. The fact that those discussions are happening is significant. It tells us for the first time in a long, long time. Uh, that the NHL is is finally willing or at least you know seriously seriously contemplating moving on from what has been a very challenging situation in Arizona basically going back more than a decade but you know it doesn't guarantee this is going to happen and i can tell you as of thursday morning that that coyotes players had been told that there's still a sort of circumstances where the next year they could play at a mullet arena uh, i think that only happens if one or both of these sale processes break down and they're not able to kind of thread the needle and get everything done in time for next season. And so it's a very strange, you know, story for us to kind of pick through and for maybe the public that aren't paying attention to this every day, because everyone wants to report it like it's a done deal. I can assure you it's not a done deal. Um, you know, you have, I think that the Morello family still does want to try to get a rink in Arizona. And I think as part of this, you could see them end up having the rights to any future team there for a period of time, if they are able to, you know, go and proceed and win that land auction. So two things could be true. There is a there's a, a universe here where the Morello family wins the land auction June 27th, starts moving forward towards building an arena and an entertainment district in Phoenix. And also the Coyotes are playing in Salt Lake City next year. I mean, that both of those things could be true. So it's not an either or proposition. And and so that's sort of where we're at right now. I mean, it's it's a difficult situation. It's been difficult all year there. Um you know, for, for the players, for the staff of that team. I mean, I think the uncertainty has already been crashing down on them. But for this news to break, uh, you know, on, on Wednesday, basically a, an avalanche of, of reporting on this in, in numerous sites, uh, you know, hours before the 79th game of the season, a season that's already lost for them. I mean, I think that this is, a, this is really unique. It's different, remember, than how it went down with the Thrashers and Winnipeg, where that, that all unfolded quickly in the offseason. I mean, the fact that this is happening – still with a couple games left on the coyote schedule is very unusual. That's that's my that's where I want to start first. I have a ton of questions about this, but how do you feel about the fact that this story in a matter of days has gotten to this point where I I I I I know the fact that you're not look, looking to put dates on this, but this team could be gone to another market relatively soon. Like this is all happening so fast. Right. And there's players on the team that own houses in Phoenix. Some of them have played there for a number of years. It's home. It's where they have families and kids and have to worry about, hey, do I enroll my kid in school for next year or, you know, have very sort of real day to day decisions or, or obligations, whatever commitments you want to call them that that, are, that all hang in the balance here? Because it is true. Like, like, I would say if you're handicapping it, you know, once the league has made this step where they're trying to, to get the team to Salt Lake City, that's probably the most likely outcome. But I can't predict if one or both of the, you know, the, the, the sale, the sales ownership side, the Morello side or the Smith side, if something doesn't feel right to them, you know, this could go off the rails. It could, it could not happen for next season. And then you're back playing at Mullet Arena next year. And so this is, 
it's it's truly unusual. And, you know, the Coyotes have one game left in this regular season at home. They're, they're in Edmonton Friday. They come see you in Calgary on Sunday, and then they're back home next mm-hmm. Wednesday for a game against the Oilers to, to complete the regular season schedule. But, I mean, it's going to be a pretty unusual scene, no matter what might change even between now and then, uh, whether we know for sure that they're going or if it's still just an open question. I mean, that, that last game, I mean, there's nothing really equivalent. I mean, probably – You'd have to go back to the the first version of the Jets, the one that moved to Arizona. Uh, you know, some of that did sort of spiral and become known in the last kind of days of that regular season in '96 before they moved. But I mean, this this is an unusual set of circumstances. We're in a social media world. I mean, the Coyotes aren't allowing their players to speak, at least as of yet. Uh, they they didn't open their dressing room as is league protocol after the game in Vancouver on Wednesday. You know, I'm not necessarily even criticizing them for that. I, I don't know what you would say as a player. But it just, I'm kind of bringing up all these, you know, these examples as, as you know, to kind of hold up like how strange and weird and unprecedented and unusual this is. And, you know, in the meantime, there's still a lot of maneuvering going on behind the scenes about whether they can, the, the lawyers can get to a point where they're ready to close one sale and then uh, close a second sale in quick succession to see this team move by next season. Okay. Before I get to the Salt Lake City portion of this. One more Arizona question. I mean, there's going to be a bunch of those, but one specifically with the Coyotes <laughs> I was going to say, here. You're not stopping at one, brother. Oh no, definitely not. What do you do if you're the Coyotes and your ownership? And yes, you are going to be bidding on that plot of land, a plot of land in late Jan- in late June. But what can you do to buy yourself more time if you are still committed to at least keeping hockey in the desert for a few more seasons? Well, what's needed ultimately is you need proper facilities like NHL caliber facilities for that team or for any team to call Arizona home or anywhere. 100%. Uh, you know, like they've been, they've been trying to buy time and stall for years, right? There was, there was land they talked about in Mesa. They went through the whole thing in Tempe with the referendum last year. You know, there's been other potential, you know, projects that, that didn't come to fruition. And, and so, you know, I'm not predicting because I, I admittedly do not know enough about whether this one has a, a chance of success or not, but, even if it succeeds, you're looking at three more years be- at least before you're opening a new arena. And I just don't think with the way things are at Muller Arena, my understanding, you know, I've talked to some some former Coyotes players and reached out to a couple current members of the team just to, you know, take a temperature check would be the best way to put it. And like, it's not going well there. And, you know, I think that that was entirely predictable. But, you know, the only reason to go there initially is they were trying to buy time to get this arena built. And and it just seems that, you know, the clock is is about to run out. Um, but, you know, I really I got to be careful. I, I don't I don't uh, radio myself on my own show because no. I really want to say it again, and again, and again. There is a world where this could fall apart. Um, like we're not at the finish line. It, I mean, it, the finish line could come quickly, of course. But, you know, it's a delicate stage of the, the talks in terms of getting everything satisfied on both sides of the agreement. And, you know, let's just see if they get there, I, I suppose. But, man, it's the, the reason that that this hasn't worked ultimately. I mean, there's, there's all kinds over time though, is that the NHL has never li- lined up the right ownership group in Arizona and they've never been playing out of the right facility. I mean, the arena in Glendale was totally fine from a, from a arena standpoint. I was there a number of times covering games perfectly looked, looked and felt like an NHL arena everywhere possible, but it was a long, long way from Phoenix. And, and from what I understand, it was a long, long way from where a lot of their, their fan base would be driving from closer to the Scottsdale area. And, and so you know, you just didn't have fans on a Tuesday night in the middle of winter that necessarily wanted to drive out there. And I, and I you know, I can't say I blame them. I, I find generally around the league, the, the teams that are most successful have pretty centrally located buildings. So they, they haven't ever had the arena in the right place and, and the right ownership group in place to make it sing. Um, you know, I do think that we're going to be talking about them coming back if, if they do end up leaving here. I, I really just think the market is too strong. I mean, we have like new players from Arizona entering the league every day. I mean, the, the guy leading the league in goals right now is from there, but even younger players like Josh Doan and Matthew Nyes, uh, you know, were born and raised in, in Arizona. And I know there's a number of kids coming behind them that are either playing the WHL or an NCAA. And, and, you know, it's been a success story. Oddly enough, the Coyotes as a team have not been a success story, but from a, from growing hockey in a place where it wasn't too popular before they've, they've actually had a lot of successes and I, and I think they will continue to. And, you know, so what what has to happen in Arizona is the same thing that's been needed for freaking 10 years is they just have to get a building built. And I, I recognize, look, that's expensive. It's not easy. It involves governments. It involves a lot of moving parts. 
But I don't think the NHL, it, it just got to the point where it, it seems the NHL knows it can't just sit and wait and wait and wait and wait and hope that, you know, that things change. I think that they, you know, if everything works out the way the league is now focused on, you know, they're, they're going to be taking this team to a city where it's going to host the, the Olympics in 2032, where there's already a commitment from local government there to build a new arena where you have a very gung-ho owner and Ryan Smith and Ashley Smith, his wife, who, you know, have already owned the jazz in that marketplace and, and the MLS team. And, you know, I just think that it's, it's kind of a no brainer if you can make all the dollars work and everyone be agreed that you, you move a, a team to a place like that and you, you focus on, okay, well, someone in it has to eventually get an arena built in Arizona and we'll come back just like they came back in Minnesota. That's the way it's been described to me. This is Minnesota 2.0. If it all goes down, because when, you know, when the North stars originally left, there was no one at the NHL level who didn't think Minnesota would be a good hockey market. I mean, don't they call it the state of hockey, for goodness sake? I mean, yeah, they literally do. So, like, it, it, no one was doubting Minnesota as, an, as their hockey market, but they didn't have the right circumstances there for the team to function. Ultimately, they got those in place. They got a new arena in St. Paul, and the Wild have been a successful team, um, you know, from a revenue standpoint, like, from an interest standpoint, ever since returning there. I, I think that you're, you'll see something similar to that in Arizona, but how long that takes to play out, I mean, that's – that's that's the big unknown here. That's the unknown unknown. It could be five years or it could be 12 years. I mean, it just depends on on what happens. Um, again, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but assuming they, they move before next season, then it's it's what happens in that market even once they're gone. It's funny you say getting ahead of yourself because, again, this situation keeps devolving as it is just in, in, in days here. I'm intrigued with the idea that you you keep tempering you're tempering a little bit of the it's weird to say expectations but it I'm, the sense I'm getting is that this could happen really quickly but you're you keep saying that there's a chance this can fall through considering the situation that Salt Lake City presents with the facilities that they have the ownership and everything else they have going on what does that world look like where it somehow falls apart because I don't see it happening well. The thing is that if it's going to happen for next season, it has to happen quickly. I mean, that's just a product of where we're at in the calendar and, and you know, all that goes into moving a team. I mean, the, the league has drafted two schedules next year that, that could be used for either a team based in, in Tempe, where the Coyotes have been, or out of Utah. And so, you know, obviously the league can put contingencies in that place in, in, that, in that sort of circumstance. But, you know, it has to get done quickly so it could all happen. And, and if it doesn't, if one side or the other fails, you know, I don't know when the exact deadline is, but, you know, I always point you back to that May 31st deadline um, when, when Atlanta moved officially to Winnipeg or when the, that news was made public anyway, you know, I think that that's the kind of time frame you're looking at, but here we are, you know, we're, we're approaching mid April. I mean, it's, it's probably got to happen within a month or a little bit more than that, you know, for everything to be satisfied. Um, how does it fall apart? I mean, I, I think there's a number of ways it could, but, you know, maybe if, if they go through a process, um, you know, with the Morello family and what happens at the end, they're like, you know what? We don't feel comfortable with the terms of this deal. Like we're not going to sell right now. I mean, that's one way it could fall apart. Similarly on Ryan Smith's end, maybe, you know, he's looking through what, what the, you know, is on the table for his group. And he's like, you know, we really want an NHL team, but you know, we'd rather it be an expansion team. I'm not sure we want to acquire this particular organization. I mean, those are the types of things in, in very simple terms, I think that could derail the deal. Um, you know, Again, I'm with you in that it lines up that it's it's likely to all fall together because, you know, it, if it's a billion dollars that Morello's getting for the team, you know, for a sale price, you know, that represents a pretty big growth on the investment he made in buying it. So he's going to make some money, assuming he gets some kind of um, assurances or something, you know, put in writing that he has rights to that market for an NHL team for X number of years and he's satisfied with that. I mean, that gets done and then it's really just about the, you know, as long as... Ryan Smith's comfortable with the price he's being asked to pay. So, you know, it's it's like getting in a negotiation for a house. You can really like the house, and at the last minute, you might be like, ah, just a little bit more than I wanted to pay, or there's something doesn't feel right. I'm worried that I'm worried that I'm gonna have to put a new roof on in the next year. I mean, there's there's I guess there's a number of things that that could that could pop up here, and and so that's why the league is in a tough spot in terms of a lot of this is getting out now. Obviously, that they've sent uh, a few updates to, to the board of governors in recent days, just just as you know, basically memo typical memos to update the process and where they're at but you know they can't say a whole lot right now because there's there's nothing to announce um but we all know kind of what what they're working on i guess is the best way to put it and so that's why it's 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 a weird story but i mean look teams don't get moved too often right i mean the last time it happened was 13 years ago 
So, you know, I, I don't blame anyone for this getting public. A lot of people obviously have to know about it. There's a lot of focus on the, the situation. And then, you know, once you're communicating to other teams, you're just, you're, you're widening the network of who's getting the info. And, uh, you know, here we are today. While we're on the subject of continuing to paint these pictures of worlds of possibilities, is there a world where the Coyotes get sold to Salt Lake City, but the Morellos are still bidding on that plot of land? They win that plot of land, they build their district, and when the NHL decides that they want to go back to Arizona, they end up back in business with the Morellos. It seems like that's at least being discussed, yes. I mean... Again, a lot of things have to happen there. The, the Morellos have have tried and failed a number of times to get other arenas built. So, you know, for, for that to ever happen where the NHL would be getting back in business with the Morellos after potentially selling the team, they would have to actually, you know, see one of these projects through. And and so, you know, that's the, the first thing that, that that pops to my mind. You know, I know that there are other people in that market that have deep pockets that I think have interest in in being NHL owners. And so, it, you know, it doesn't necessarily end up being the Morellos. I mean, we're, we're getting a little far down the road that it's, you know, it's hard to say anything with any confidence. But, you know, I think it's it's possible uh, how likely it is. I, you know, I, I just don't I don't like the track record of the team not being able to get an arena built. I mean, at the end of the day, you can make promises and you can put out renderings and you can, you know, say a lot of things, nice things about what you hope to do. But, it, it, you know, eventually it gets to results time, right? And I think we're past results time. You know, there's a couple soft deadlines this year that they blew through without, you know, getting anything done. Now there's, you know, this June 27th land auction. Like, I think, I think the NHL eventually just realized like they have to, they have to intervene. And, you know, it coincides with the fact that it's only been since about 2022 that the, the Smith family has engaged with the NHL about Salt Lake. So that's, a, you know, it's a relatively new option that's been, you know, put on the table uh, that's emerged. I think it's an intriguing option, you know, Ryan Smith, and his wife Ashley. I mean, they're in their forties. Like they're they're young. They're very successful. They run other teams. They have a proven track record in the marketplace. They seem to really, 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 really want NHL hockey, which you know is obviously a positive if the person that's trying to or the people that are trying to enter your league are that enthusiastic about it. And so, I think this this solution is kind of it didn't appear out of nowhere because the conversations go back a couple of years with the league. But they, it's relative to how these things, you know. You don't flip a franchise the way you, you know, you might sell a, an extra chair on Kijiji, right? Like it, you, you, you could post your, your computer chair on Kijiji and, and conceivably sell it this afafternoon. Well, I mean, NHL franchises, it's, it, there's a lot more involved and at stake in, in those kind of size of transactions and, and various things. So, I mean, this is relative to how transactions happen of NHL teams. This has kind of come on the radar in recent times. And, and I think that they're looking to strike on, you know, what appear to be a lot of aligned interests here, you know, quite honestly, it's a solution to a big problem. Uh, it's, it's a short-term solution. It might not even be a perfect solution. I mean, we should say the Delta Center, uh, where the Utah Jazz play currently, which would be the sort of interim home of a potential NHL team, it only holds about 14,000 um, capacity for hockey. It's not, was not a building designed to, with, you know, NHL hockey in mind. But I think that there, you do that because first of all, 14,000 is better than 4,600, which is the capacity of Mullet Arena. It's it's an excited owner and it's, you know, an owner that's that's going to get another building built. I mean, with the fact that the Olympics are earmarked to return to Salt Lake City in 2032. And, you know, it seems as though there's a lot of progress already been made to actually constructing a new arena. You don't mind playing in maybe a, a less than ideal arena when you know there's a new one coming. That's that's the piece that the Coyotes <laughs> never, never had is they've been playing in less than, you know, ideal circumstances. And there's no there's. There's no water on the horizon. They're just wandering around the desert. There's no water. There's no oasis. There's nothing. There's nothing to. Um, there's nothing but those computer renderings so far. And and you know that's just not good enough after a certain period of time. The computer renderings and stock footage, I might add. But with Salt Lake City, we've we've you've done a great job of of building up why they're likely going to be the viable candidate to get the Coyotes. But I still hear. Uh, the listeners and viewers of our show banging on the glass, wondering, well, why not Quebec City? Why not another team in Ontario? Why is it that Salt Lake City has to be the team when there are so many other markets, particularly in Canada, that could be deserving of a team? You've got a, an owner. You've got a building. You've got a big enough market. I mean, I, I think it's I think it's that simple. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say there can never be another team in Quebec City, but I think the the odds are long. You know, Winnipeg 
needed a lot to come together to get the Jets reborn. And, you know, I know we touched on this a couple months ago. It's, it's not been easy, even with a good team, even in a city where everyone loves hockey, you know, they're, they are struggling financially and, and things have gotten better. I'm happy to report since, you know, I went down there and spoke to Mark Chipman and we, you know, wrote that story. They, they've had a you know string of sellouts in some of the games since, you know, obviously they're headed for the Stanley cup playoffs here. And so maybe there was some bit of a wake up call there, but the point is, is it's hard doing business in small markets. And Quebec City is a small market. There's just there's just no way around it. Um, and so, you know, I think that um, I think that's probably the easy answer. And, and then right now you have an owner, right? Is like who who's stepping up in Quebec City and paying potentially one point two, one point three billion for a team and moving it there and thinking that that he or she can make money uh, doing so. I just I, I think that you know the Canadian dollar is still struggling. I mean, we're talking about U.S. dollars here too, right? I mean, it, it's. Look, I, I hope Quebec gets a team back because I know people there love the love hockey and and you know they've they built a beautiful arena, uh, the Videotron Center. I mean, it's but you, it just it might be a little too big for what the market can support. It's just it's just the cold hard facts, and I don't think that the same concerns exist in Salt Lake City. Now we'll see. Um, what, not not every uh, not every NHL gambit is is created equal, right? They've been to Atlanta twice and left. Then they went to Nashville, and for there were times it didn't look great. They were almost sold and moved at one point, and you know now Nashville's you know very strong, I would say NHL market. So, you know, I think that it just makes too much sense at this time, and it's also a ready-made option. It's like it's it's basically ready to go, right? And that's that was part of what what Ryan Smith said when you know back in January twenty fourth when he said to the league that open an expansion process. He's basically like, I've got an arena here, I can host a team next season. I, I'm ready to go. I'm excited about this. And so I think I think it's, you know, timing is everything in life, right? And I just think the timing is right for this to come together for, for this team to go to Salt Lake City if they can complete the sale. Uh, just coming to my mind right now, I believe Ian Mendez this week uh, wrote a profile on Ryan Smith, which you can read in The Athletic. He went to Salt Lake City for a couple of days, hung out with Ryan, and Ryan really tried to come across as a really convincing person on on the city of Salt Lake and and how the population is booming and how they are basically have all these facilities and teams in place to really capitalize on a growing city. I, I don't know if you, I'm pretty sure you got to read that story. What were your impressions of it? Yeah, really positive. I mean, seems like a, a very bright man who's had a lot of success in business is, and believes in his community, has the ability to get things done in his community, which is important because they still do need to get an arena built ultimately for this to be something that's successful long-term, which is, you know, whenever you're moving a team or, or, you know, awarding a team through expansion, the goal has to be that it's going to be a long-term relationship. Right. And so, you know, I think that he ticks a lot of boxes that way from what I've been told, he's got a great rapport uh, with, with Gary Bettman and the senior leadership at the NHL. I think that, that he's impressed them from day one. And, you know, I think that they're, he's giving off for me a little bit some Mark Chipman vibes, which is, that he he knows how to do business with the NHL. I think he's done a nice job of sort of marketing himself, but also, you know, not stepping on any toes and just basically being being ready for the, you know, he's not making too many overt overtures about this. He's just, he's been ready to accept um, a team when when one comes available. And it seems that one is definitely now available. I mean, I, I know for a fact that, that you know, that the Smith group is engaged in active talks with the league about, you know, buying the team. They're not dealing with Morello directly, as I mentioned. So it's two sales, not one sale. And anytime you have to do something twice, it's more complicated than doing it once. Uh, so that, that that's that's part of the dynamic that's going on. And you know, the, the tough thing too is we probably haven't shed enough light on it. Is just what it would be like to be a player in this circumstance. And you know, I talked to Matt Dumba. That for was a my very ne- that was my very next question. I wanted to know how the players are are feeling about this. You know, I think that there's mixed reactions, right? You got some players on the roster that are young and probably but they don't have these deeper roots placed and they're just kind of like, whatever you have some players that are due to be free agents. Uh, in fact, a lot of them on the blue line, if you go, go call up the team's uh, page, you'll see that they have a lot of pending uh, UFAs and RFAs unsigned. So that those guys, you know, might have an opportunity to go any, elsewhere anyway, you know, and then there's, there's obviously, I think some that will be disappointed that, that have lived there a long time that own houses that love the lifestyle. I mean, no one anywhere is debating that Arizona is, is not a good place to live and apply your trade. Um, you know, I spoke with Matt Dumbo, who was traded by the Lightning at the deadline to Tampa, and he was pretty open about it. I, I asked basically, like, like, do you think the uncertainty of what's going on is being felt? He's like, you feel it every time you walk into Mullet. 
He's like, it's basically like mental warfare for those guys. And, you know, that says a lot. I mean, I, I don't expect any current members of the team, if and when they do get in front of the microphones here in the next week or so, to say anything quite that strong. But, you know, Dumba was traded and has a little bit more freedom, to be honest about it. And he pointed to the, the fact, Julian, they had a run that, where they went 0-12-2 and um, from basically the end of January to the end of February. And, you know, that coincided with the Ryan Smith, you know, expansion uh, application. It coincided with Marty Walsh, the NHLPA executive director, teeing off on the situation at, at All-Star. And, you know, all this stuff was starting to get, you know, I think grow a little louder and swirl. And Dumba said, like, we didn't even play that bad then, but he just felt like the weight of it all was 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 holding the back a little bit, was was just keeping the team from, you know, functioning at its highest level. And, and ultimately, if you look at that stretch, that's sunk their season. Um they go 500 in that stretch, a little better than that. They might actually be kind of in a playoff race today. And, and I know it's easy. You you could pick any team's worst stretch and be like, well, if they won a bunch of those games instead of losing them all. But, you know, Arizona did start this season, certainly not at the back of the pack where they've, they've kind of settled in now. Um, and I just, I think that there, there's been a real, you could imagine if you were working this year and you just didn't know where you're going to live, you, you might have a partner or kids asking questions, you know, like just, just so many unknowns. Um, I talked to Vander Kane too, actually in, in that same story that just came out on the athletic today. And, and, you know, yeah. one thing he said, he said uh, when the Thrashers moved to Winnipeg, he's like, it's the uncertainty that kills you. Like, he's just like, like, it's just like your brain goes in all kinds of directions, thinking about everything that could maybe happen. And, and, you know, I think that's a hard place to perform at your job. It's hard to probably feel comfortable or, or, you know, settled in your life when that's going on. And, I don't think we should look past that fact. I mean, I certainly am not sitting here celebrating that this appears like it's likely to happen. Cause I, I do know a lot of people in, in that market that have worked hard to, to make the hockey community into something real. And a lot of people that have, you know, tried to make the coyotes into something real. I mean, what will be fascinating to me is like, if they move, get a new owner, I don't know what'll happen to the state of management and coaching staff. Like, I don't know how that'll shake out, but like, look at the draft pick capital they have. Like, they're actually pretty well set up for a new owner to, to, to step in. Like the, the last thing you want as a new owner, I would think is a bunch of contracts that are like to underperforming players, like heavy contracts. Like they, they don't have a lot of that. I mean, there's a few players signing longer term, but there's still guys like Clayton Keller, you know, still in the meat of their career, still performing well. And, you know, for the most part, you know, they've got freedom to step in and start making a bunch of trades if they want with those draft picks. Uh, they got some prospects coming. They can be big players in free agency because they're going to have to spend money. No matter where they're playing next season, they're going to have to spend money to hit the, the, the salary cap floor at the, at the present time. And so, you know, I actually think with a fresh set of eyes on this, what this team is and the assets it has, like they could actually be pretty competitive pretty soon, I think, if, if, if done right. Um, what you mentioned, uh, just kind of thinking about people in that market, I can't help but think of people like Craig Morgan who have been covering Arizona hockey for for quite some time. And now that if this comes to fruition with the Coyotes move, what does that do for, for him? What does that do for people in media? Obviously we're media guys. We're going to think about media. Well, I wonder what that does for, for those guys. And, and, and the fact that the Coyotes may not be a thing. They're probably covering the NFL next week. You know, I hate to, that's just the reality. Could. You're absolutely right. That's just a reality. I mean, the NFL is a behemoth in the U.S. especially, and, and I think there's more opportunity there. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I traded some messages with Craig. He seemed to be in, in good spirits about it all. I mean, you know, don't want to share exactly what he shared because it wasn't, uh, wasn't meant to be public. But, you know, I think he understands. Like that. The one thing is, is if you've covered it as closely as he has, and I can tell you, I've been going to Phoenix – for games. I, I think the first time I would have got there was about 20, 2009, maybe for a game. So let's call it the last 15 years. I've been going there. Like I, I never remember basically not seeing Craig around whenever you're there. I mean, he's been a, he's been a fixture covering the team. Um, and so when you cover the team, I think you understand, you know, sometimes some of the speculation that's gone on in those years has been nonsense, but I think it's increasingly had credibility, right? I mean, you get the, you get the owner of, or sorry, the owner, the, the executive director of the players association saying what Marty Walsh said. I mean, that, that is a sign that there's real urgency. And, you know, ultimately, of course, it's not Walsh's call. It's not the player's call where, where teams are placed. They don't have any, any formal say in that process. But I mean, I think that you see things like that. 
you know, you, you see the expansion application. You know, I just it just was becoming clear that this was a possibility, and and you know, now we're getting to the time where either the deals get struck or I don't even want to imagine actually. Given how public this is, I don't even want to imagine what it would look like if they had to return for one more year and still be oh figuring God. things out. Oh my god! Like that's could you imagine? That's the that? alternate universe here. Is like, and I know that. So, so of course, for the players maybe who want to stay, that's nice. You don't have to move, but like, it's just going to be if if it was hanging over this season to the degree that Matt Dumba called it mental warfare. I mean, what would it be like next season if you knew it was likely the last and it was just about you know needing more time to get some deals done? I mean, that that would be that would be awful. I know we've spoken about the Coyotes for almost 30 minutes now. Is there anything else about this story that you'd like to mention that I didn't get to touch on or just deserves to be spoken about a little bit more? Well, there's there's some interesting downstream effects, right? I mean, they, they, you might be looking at realignment if, if this happens just with, with teams. So we might get some new divisional positions. Although I will remind those of you that were too young, the, the Winnipeg Jets played one season in the old Southeast division. Uh, in the same division as teams like Florida and Carolina and and others that were nowhere near close to them. But I think that, you know, this kind of move might fo- force some changes there. Um, you know, and I do, if I didn't make this point strong enough, I really believe Arizona will be talking about as a hot uh, expansion market should this all go down. Um, so, you know, I'll see, I'll see if, uh, see how it all happens. But I, I, I think the NHL will ultimately be, be back there, but, you know, they just need need an arena built, and that uh, that's proven to be very difficult. That's true. On realignment, uh, I'm not I'm not completely opposed to the uh, Alberta teams being moved to the Central Division. I, I saw I forget who had the mock up. It might have been Zach Lang who uh, who covers the Oilers, but I think they I saw one scheme where they had I think the Kraken, the Canucks, all the Alberta teams, uh, Winnipeg. Chicago, St. Louis in one division. You put all the California teams in, keep them in the Pacific, but just move the Avalanche and I think Dallas in, in, in that division too. Like, I wish I had the visual for you to properly explain this, but that's just an idea that's been floated around. It could be that, who knows? But I wouldn't be opposed to seeing more Connor Bedard in, uh, in the division of the team I currently uh, uh, cover. There you go. How does it how does it work for you? I like that. I mean, look at th- that issue. <laughs> yeah. That issue isn't that issue isn't solved yet because it's not front burner, right? I mean, and you right. might have saw you might have saw that there's a report out about maybe the AHL team of Salt Lake City moving to Mullet Arena. Um, yes. you know, my understanding of that it's like seems like that's done done. I don't even think it's way down the road, but I think it's a possibility. But all those things are the kind of details that have to get figured out after the major ones do. And, and the major ones are still. Where's this team playing next year? What does that look like? How does the sale and the transition go? And so, you know, all that stuff will be, we'll still have time to dig into because I don't think it's, I, by no means do I get a sense it's, it's decided or, or cemented just yet. For sure. A uh, hat tip to uh, Tony Androkitis or Androkitis. I'm sorry if I didn't get the last name in, but uh, he is the one with the uh, report about uh, the AHL affiliate possibly being moved to Mullet Arena. This episode of the Chris Johnston Show is brought to you by Shady Rays. Get ready for the season ahead with quality shades built to last. Our friends at Shady Rays have you covered with premium polarized shades that won't break the bank. If you don't know anything about Shady Rays, they're a company that offers a world-class product rated five stars by over 300,000 people. Their shades have durable frames and crystal clear optics, making them the perfect choice for all outdoor adventures. Whether you want to go out to the mountains whether you want to just walk around downtown or you want to just, you know, hey, look cool in your own apartment, just like I'm doing right now for this ad. They have hundreds of options to choose from, so you're bound to find the perfect pair to match your style. Plus, if your shades ever go missing or take an unexpected hit, don't sweat it. They have the most insane protection in all of eyewear. Every pair is backed by lost or broken replacements, and if you don't love your shades, exchange them for a new pair or return worry-free within 30 days there's no risk when you shop their team always has your back with personal and fast support they got a real nice deal at shady rays right now go to shadyrays.com and use code johnston for 50 percent off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses that's two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses 50 percent off if you go to shadyrays.com and use the code johnston it's their best deal of the season Try for yourself the shades rated five stars by over 300,000 people.
Um, if that's it for the Coyotes, we should get to another story that we've actually been talking about quite a bit on this show. But now that you've you've kind of written it for the Athletic, we definitely have to talk about it again. It's the future of Steven Stamkos in Tampa Bay and uh, him being a UFA this off season. Great job talking to players about him and bringing that story to light. What else can you say about his situation right now? Well, I think it's it's really has been bubbling under the surface, and you know, I, I nothing has changed to the degree that I can tell, other than you know we're down to the last couple of regular season games for Tampa, and then they're going into the playoffs, and then we all jump into the great unknown when it comes to the Stamco situation. And so, you know, the goal for Joe Smith and I, and working on that story, we went around and talked to a whole bunch of players, you know, mostly former teammates of Stamco's, although a couple like Victor Hedman who are currently playing with them, just about what he means to the Lightning, what's made him unique and special over the years. And then, you know, some of those players like uh, Alex Kalorn, Andre Pilat, um, Yanni Gord, a lot, some of those players have been through this with the Lightning where they were kind of moved on from um, for cap reasons. And and so they've, they've, they've experienced it. They, they know the guy really well and they've experienced what he's going through to a certain degree. Now there's only one Stamkos and I think that that's what, makes him different. I mean, if you look at it, he's, he's almost half his life in the organization and, and the organization has had him on the roster almost half their, their existence. Like they, they almost neither side can remember a time without the other. Uh, and yet, you know, the fact that he's, he is unsigned, I think is, is pretty compelling. You know, Kalorn was interviewed by Joe Smith and he, you know, he was pretty open. You know, he said what I think we would all know, like, yeah, of course he wants to sign there, but he did say, but you're talking about a hall of famer. And if at a certain period, you don't feel wanted. Well, then you're going to, you know, you got pride will kick in right at some point. And so, yeah. you know, I don't think that, that truly anything will happen on, on this file until Tampa's played its last game of the season. I mean, ironically, I think you could argue if, if they go far in the playoffs, probably easier to bring them back. I would think more of a case that they're still a true contender and that he's a, a big part of the puzzle. I mean, as we're recording this right now, he just had a hat trick this week in a game. He's up to 39 goals in the season. Um, better than a point per game player at this point in time. You know, certainly not what he once was, but I think still pretty effective. And, and you know, I would imagine there's there's some compromise that can be reached between two sides that should want the same thing in terms of what he needs to be paid, how long the contract is, all those sorts of things. I mean, this doesn't necessarily need to be contentious, but the fact it just hasn't been addressed at all in terms of money and everything. I just, it, you know, it's a bit of a weird feeling. And so I do think we're at a point where it's possible. We might have to imagine the lightning without Stamkos. You get this close, you know, we had to sort of briefly imagine Pittsburgh without maybe Malkin a couple of years ago, he ends up signing in the last couple of days before hitting the open market. I mean, there's still time to get a deal done, of course, but it's just kind of hanging there. And a lot of, I'll tell you, a lot of people are talking about this. Like I've in the, in the process of talking to a number of Stamkos's former teammates, like, I got the impression that when they go out to dinner on the road and they're having a glass of wine, they're like, like, they're kind of like, us, like, Whoa, like what's going on there. And you know, like people like, is he coming back? It's a point of, it's a point of interest, right. For a lot of people, I think because he's touched so many people too. I mean, he's been everything. It should be said when you get a number one overall pick in the draft, this is, this is, is about as good as it gets. I mean, obviously there's a few players that we'd put ahead of him in the hierarchy from his generation, but I mean, he's, one of a few guys ever with more than 500 goals and 500 assists. He's taken you to the Stanley cup four times as a captain. He's one, two um, in the community. You know, I know he, he recently did a make a wish, uh, you know, kind of situation recently for the lightning, like the teammates, they don't just say like, Oh, he's a good leader. Like it's not like robot quotes. Like, like Andre Plot said, I'm happy. He's my friend, which I mean, I, I actually think in a roundabout way, like what bigger compliment could you pay someone when you're saying, I'm just happy. Yeah. He's my friend. Like, it's like, I'm lucky to even know him is, is, is kind of how I would translate that quote. Um, you know, Luke Shen told me about when, when he rejoined the lightning at one point, his wife had just had a baby and Stamkos immediately calls him and says, just stay at my house. It was during the COVID time. Things were complicated, stays at his house. He said he, he gave me a car to drive for the year uh, too. And I was like, Oh, is it a nice car? He goes, it was a Jag. So, I mean, he's the kind of guy that's, he's opened his house. He's, you know, I, I, and he's not the only one in the league, but like he's, the, the point is, is he's as classy as he comes, as they come. He's been only outscored by Alex Ovechkin since he entered the NHL. 
Only Ovechkin, Crosby, and Patrick Kane have more points in him since he entered the NHL. He's been with one team. They've had all sorts of success. I mean, anyway, you slice this. He's the kind of player you hold on to. But maybe they won't because the Lightning, if we know one thing, they, they have made difficult and harsh decisions in the past uh, in an effort to try to beat Father Time just to keep their cup window open. And, you know, I don't think you can rule out the possibility it happens again. Absolutely not. And we are definitely going to be following up with this story in the off season. We've a uh, tight, uh, quick show today discussing Arizona and Tampa Bay. Uh, it is Thursday, so it's time for us to do some stick taps. Do you have a stick tap for this week, CJ? You go first. I was hoping you would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, man. Just today's been a bit of a, a wild day. Um, I'll just, you know what, man? I'll just say, uh, I'll just take this as an opportunity to say, uh, thank you to everyone who wished me happy birthday today. Thank you for the messages in the group chat, obviously, this morning. Oh, my God. I dropped the ball. Chat. We're 40 minutes in, and I didn't even bring that up yet. <laughs> well, I mean, like, everyone, well, I mean, like, I, we kind of went through that, like, before we recorded. So I was totally cool with that. That's fine. That's okay. I know. Dude. So it's Jul- Julian McKenzie's birthday today and Pierre Lebrun's. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I wish Pierre happy birthday. That's good. But it's just funny. Actually, like, actually, I don't even know if we're allowed to let everyone know that it's Pierre's birthday. He's very secretive about that, I think. Oh, I just did. I mean, I think, yeah, they, outed did. Him, <laughs> I think they outed him on Toronto Radio today, too. So, Ooh. yeah, so I don't like, know. I messed, I don't, yeah, I don't know if he was happy about that or what, but <laughs> sorry, Pierre. Um, but thank you to everyone who uh, took the time to wish me happy birthday. Uh, that means a lot. Um, yeah, just seriously. So stick tap to you guys. Also, uh, stick tap to uh, Jai Deep. Uh, he is a 100 percenter. Uh, one of my uh, good buddies here in uh, in Calgary, Saul and Volji, was hanging out with him the other day, and he said some really nice things. And I put a mental note that I would shout him out on uh, this week's uh, CJ show. Uh, you might not remember him, CJ, but he met us at the uh, fan appreciation event that we had in Montreal a couple years ago. There, like, I okay, I do remember that. Photo. Yeah, yeah, we got sent the photo like him and his wife and their kid. Like, like yeah. it, it, they're all there. Like, it's it's a great photo. Nice. Well, in that spirit, then I'll stick tap the random stranger who this week, when I was out for a morning jog, yelled from across the street, "CJ, I love the pod," because uh, like that never gets old. It obviously doesn't happen every day, but it's it's just cool to know that you know, like you that there's people out there listening. So we're nothing without you. And I didn't prepare. I didn't do my homework in terms of thinking of a really deep and detailed one, but that was a nice moment in my week. Uh, the other day when I was out running in my hood and someone, someone walking their kids to school, took the time to say they love our pod, Julian, man, uh, this show is nothing without the 100 percenters. So we thank you deeply from the bottom of our, of our hearts, uh, that you continue to watch and listen to our show. We'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode. Get your questions in now. If you're on Twitter or X, Use the hashtag AskCJ. If you're on Discord, you can use the hashtag there as well. Just get your questions in. We'll get to as many of them as we can for the next Ask CJ. For CJ, I'm Julian. So long. Peace. The Chris Johnston Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at ReporterChris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JKMcKenzie.